Today in the shop, we are living that stance boy life. Show them how it's done. This is a 2005 Jetta GLI. The Mark IV GLI is actually my favorite generation GLI. It came from the factory in Blue Lagoon. However, it is wrapped both a mixture of green and unpainted. This car belongs to Ben from Gears and Gasoline. He and the other Ben are taking a cross country road trip in stance boy cars, which sounds like the worst idea ever to participate. However, I think we all get to benefit from their misery and bad choices. Now, before Ben bought this car, he actually talked to me about some of the issues that it was having and then brought it down so we can get it fixed up for him. So we're gonna do a couple of things. One, I wanna show you what it takes to make a car stanced like this and some of the probably forever lasting damage as a result of riding around with your car like this. Let me just put it this way. The parking brake doesn't work but it also doesn't have to, cause you just gotta air out and get dirt nasty low. It also has a really bad oil leak and a drivability issue that we're going to address. And big thanks to Advance Auto for partnering with us on this video. They're also supporting the Benz road trip. And I think we can agree, that's a really good thing. And it does make me wonder how many stops are they gonna have to make to fix these cars? First up though, let's do the thing that I really don't wanna do and get it up on the lift. Also, if a shop ever charges you extra to work on a modified car like this, this is why. Let's get up underneath this thing and look at just what it takes to give that negative camber stance life to a car. So we'll start here on the lower suspension. This is our lower control arm. This is actually an R32 control arm and spindle that allows a little bit more negative camber. When we move down the control arm, you can see that plate right there. What that does is that takes the ball joint, which would normally be right here, and pushes it out another like two to three inches, it looks like, to move the bottom of the wheel out further, giving you even more negative camber. We also have a modified subframe so that we can actually raise the engine up both at that mounting point and the mounting point at the back. What a lot of people will also do is modify the tie rod in kind of two ways. One, flip the tie rod upside down so that rather than coming from the top down, it goes from the bottom up. This is actually the normal setup for an R32. There also looks like maybe this is an extender piece to lengthen the tie rod a little bit too. Here's another shot of that modified subframe. It's actually kind of cool, I gotta say. Moving on to the rear, you can see here's our airbag here, our Bilstein shock absorbers. What we have is a plate that actually mounts between the axle and the wheel hub. This is called the drop plate. Now this wouldn't be a Mark IV without some common Mark IV problems such as the parking brake completely destroyed. Luckily we can just slam this thing down on the fenders and we don't have to worry about a parking brake. Oh, and don't forget this, whatever this is for. And considering how little of our tire actually makes contact with the road, this is the kind of car that's gonna wear out this block of your tire pretty fast. Now I would be doing a disservice to you guys if I didn't show you some of the things that are not awesome on this car. You can see this whole bottom end has been beat up pretty bad. There's basically no more pinch weld right here. Look at, it looks like all the places where someone probably put a jack underneath this thing. I'm guessing this thing's been on a tow truck once or twice too. Now over on the passenger side, we'll also see something that's pretty common with really low cars and that's a notched frame. The major thing that I'm noticing is you can see a couple of places that something's rubbed the axle, but right here, it's probably the most significant spot. And if we kind of pan around, you can actually see where it looks like it's been rubbing on the boost pipe right there. I'm actually kind of thinking that that may be one of the main reasons for us having the drivability issue that we have, which is the car cuts power under wide open throttle at high RPM. We also have a pretty significant oil leak, which is one of the main reasons that Ben brought it up here so that I can fix that. We gotta get that fixed before we worry about the drivability concerns. We also have this heat shields completely destroyed and look it, there's an axle bolt missing and that's not tight. 
So we're gonna fix that for Ben as well. We are also missing all the under cladding here, belly pan and all this stuff is exposed. Uh, unfortunately, it's also missing the GLI front lip which is kind of a bummer. Look, look at our uh, charge cooler, it's just completely exposed. I wanna show you what's probably one of my main concerns about the drivetrain and suspension of this vehicle, and that's the rear wheel bearings. When this car is on the ground, these back wheels are all negative cambered in by like a million degrees, and that's gonna cause a ton of extra wear and damage to the wheel bearings. So check this out, first of all, we got a ton of movement in the wheel, I imagine that's pretty loud while driving. And listen to what it sounds like when you spin the wheel. Now some of that may be just some brake drag on the rear brakes, but the majority of that like grinding and clunky noise is going to be the rear wheel bearings. The other side sounds just the same. God, look at that. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get this turbo line fixed up for our buddy Ben and then we can focus on the drivability issues. I'm a little worried about those bolts up top for the return line that bolt to the turbocharger. They're a little sketchy, so we're just gonna hope for the best here, I suppose. I do have a new line and a couple of new gaskets, so that's a plus. Woo. Unfortunately, we are losing the majority of our oil. Sorry, Ben. While that's draining, I'm gonna try and carefully take these really sad looking bolts out from the return line at the turbo. That is not a place you wanna to have to extract a, a rounded out headed bolt. That one came out nice and easy. Hopefully I didn't jinx it. We'll go ahead and take this axle shield off that's completely destroyed and really not doing anything anymore. Oh geez. I would say that guy, she's toast. Let's see if we can sneak our way up here and, uh, and get that bolt out. Sometimes you gotta use your hand to find the hole before you put your tool in there. Oh, I heard a crunch. Oh, there we go. Let's get this guy out. Okay, so here is the line that we just pulled off. It's actually kind of bent and crushed, a little bit different than the one that we're gonna replace. Also, you can see it's definitely impact damage from probably where that bolt fell out. And then the broken bracket piece nicked a hole right there so good catch pretty sad let's clean her off a little bit as best we can anyway go through like five gallons of brake parts cleaner all right get the other one in make sure our gasket is also lined up we'll go ahead and get our bottom side all set into place so on further inspection, I'm actually a little concerned about this inner joint. Uh, we noticed that the bolt was missing, of course, and that little retainer piece is kind of cut in half, but check this out. And if you look real close, right there, you, you can actually see that thing is punched straight through. So uh, it looks like here where this thing broke and all this damage is right here, it punched a hole in the inner joint. It's probably gonna be okay, Maybe, I think what we need to do is we need to get that bolt out and see, see if I got another one. If not, we may have to run over to advance and try and buy one. Let's hope that the bolt's not damaged. If I can find another one, I'll take them all out and uh, lock tight them up. All right, let's get this thing fixed up here. We're gonna put our bolt in. We're gonna drop some thread locker on it. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find the exact same bolt. We'll go ahead and get that in there, snug that down. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull each one of these bolts out and put some Loctite on it. All right, so there we go. Now at least his axle is nice and tight. We don't have any clearance issues. Let's go ahead and put some oil in it and see if we can now figure out what's actually wrong with the car. One, do our visual inspection under the hood and make sure we don't have any glaring issues. Keeping in mind that we have that one boost hose that may be rubbed through. We're also gonna scan faults and see what kind of faults we got that may or may not point us in the right direction. Looks like kind of a weird, dirty, maybe a collapsing air filter. Do you have a blow off valve, which makes me wonder, is that somewhat related to our drivability issues? I'm also concerned about the tune that the car has on it. Otherwise, it's actually not terrible under the hood. In fact, this valve cover is pretty nice. We do have a bit of unsavory wiring at the battery, but 
compared to some of the Mark IVs I've seen, this actually isn't all that bad. After getting the car up to temp and running for faults, I found a couple of things. We got a lot of fault codes stored in this system, so we might actually have to kind of punch through these a grouping at a time. And unfortunately, these older cars don't give you all the parameters right here in VCDS for each individual fault. The air flow meter, which is right here, is a super duper common problem. However, because we still have some pieces of this puzzle I'm not totally sure of, including the tune, I'm not gonna throw one on just yet. Next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook up the smoke machine and we're gonna smoke the entire intake stream. This is gonna pressurize our boost hoses and allow us to see if we have a boost leak, mostly at that one that is down below. That's kind of my main point of concern. Let's see if we get any smoke coming out of this setup. So this is where our pressurized air and smoke mixture is gonna come in. This is blocked off and we're gonna smoke this entire thing. And uh, not sure if you can see that, but there is a ton of smoke. All right, now, now we gotta find where the heck it's coming from. I wonder if it's, is it coming from the, might be lower. I'm gonna take this blow off valve off and block it out. We're gonna eliminate that as a potential place for a leak. Hopefully the car's actually tuned to have this blow off valve. Typically these are tuned for a diverter valve, which means instead of blowing the air out psh, to atmosphere here, it actually recirculates it back into the intake. Pulling this off, I notice there's a bit of a nasty spot here on the hose. I don't know if that's enough to cause a problem though. Let's see what happens when I plug it with my hand. All right, it looks like it's lower than that. While I was kind of poking around at this intake boot, I actually found a completely cut detached line. This goes to the lower portion of this hose right before it goes into the turbocharger. I think it's actually part of the EVAP system. I ideally, this that's all been taken care of with a tune, but just to make sure that this is not a problem, I'm gonna just go ahead and cap it off. That way we're fixing a known problem. Hopefully that takes care of it, all the rest of it, but if not, it's not a big deal. I'll go ahead and put back all the rest of this stuff and we'll smoke test it again and see what we get. Even if that's not the final issue, that is definitely unmetered air coming in. We'll go ahead and let our smoke in. Well, it's not that big plume that I was seeing before. It seems like our blow off valve here is leaking. Okay, smoke machine to the rescue. I don't know that we would ever actually have found that issue had we not been able to pressurize that whole intake system. And one, find that vacuum line that was not attached to anything, that probably I would have found. But finding the diverter valve just leaking, excuse me, let's call it the right thing, the blow off valve leaking out really does make a lot of sense for what Ben's concern was, which was cutting out under boost so maybe that ECM's getting upset, seeing some of that boost bleeding off going, uh-uh, we got a problem. Before we go any further, we need to do a couple of things. One, we need to get either a proper diverter valve, which is what I'd rather put on there, or we need to get a new blow-off valve. I'm also gonna go ahead and order a couple of rear wheel bearings so that we can get those coming because ye yeesh, I don't wanna drive to Virginia, to California with those trashed wheel bearings. Okay, got our new diverter valve or our replacement diverter valve, I should say. Let's go ahead and get this one off of here. Put that on there, snug this guy. Put the intake back on and take her for a drive. That's probably good enough. Well, we're back and we live to tell the tale. So now we gotta figure out what's up with that fuel gauge and recheck our fault. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go into the instrument cluster and do what's called an output test. This is going to force the fuel gauge to operate. It's gonna go all the way full, all the way to zero, and then it should peg dead center in the middle. So we know our cluster's good. Now we can focus from the fuel level sender up to the cluster. Okay, first thing I think it makes sense to do is to get this back seat up and at least just look at our fuel pump connector, which also has the connector for the fuel level sender. Here, we'll get this cover off. Well, our connector for our fuel pump is broken. So that's not ideal. Why has it gotta be broken? First thing we'll do, we'll just get this connector up. Wiring looks okay. Okay, to do a quick test, 
of the wiring from here to the cluster. So we had some resistance value of the level sender, which means it's probably working, but I'm not ready to open up the fuel tank yet. We got some easier stuff to do before we go that route. So I just grabbed a resistor. I'm just gonna drop it in here and look to see the cluster fuel gauge doesn't move at all. So we may not have the right resistance value, but the fact that it doesn't do anything when we put this resistor on says to me that we may have an issue with wiring from this connector up to the cluster. And, <laughs> and just like that, uh, a little tug, tuggy tug, and we found it. So I guess no, uh, no need to go any further. <laughs> <laughs> then just right there, I guess we'll see if we can repin this. We got the OEM factory, old school factory ones. Well, that's our culprit right there. Just a little bit of a broken boopy wire. You don't ever want to make that splice too close to the connector in case for some reason you ever have to do it again. Okay, now let's plug her in, see if it works. We'll come back and shrink this and retape this, but I want to make sure it works before we do that. We also got to put our secondary lock back in. And ta-da, it works. Outstanding. Let's go ahead and get this put back together properly with all of our secondary locks and all that installed. All right, let's go ahead and put our cover back on and move on to the next thing that's wrong with this giant pile of garbage. Just kidding. It's actually not that bad. Now we are going to do something super exciting. We're gonna sit in this car and set readiness monitors for the ECM, clear the faults out and make sure we don't have any other outstanding engine issues. This is the point in time where you'd sit at the dealership with the scan tool in the car, car running and uh, play games on your phone. I guess today it's more of a sit and watch TikToks. So. <laughs> oh. Well, our numbers have corrected a bit, so that's kind of good. All right, let's get our wheel bearing. <laughs> our wheel bearing taken care of. I actually got two new wheel bearings for both rears. Now, I did the passenger side thinking, I'll just knock this one out, and then we'll, I'll show you guys on this side what we're doing. However, we had some sadness. First of all, look at this caliper bracket. Not ideal, but then something super sad the pin, this pin on, this was the top side, actually broke. So um, yeah, not, not awesome. I messed with it for a little while and then figured it's probably better just to go ahead and get another one. In fact, the caliper's kind of trash too. We're gonna just roll with it, get this put back together, and then we'll test it. So unfortunately, we're held up a day or so waiting on that part, not the end of the world, and we got other work to do. So first up, let's get this wheel off. Next, we can take off our adapter plate. Oh boy, oh, I missed one. There we go. Ow, there we go. Oh, this is what the problem was. So I had this ring right here, we'll clean all that up. And we did have a screw in there, so I'm glad, I'm glad. I would've been really mad if that screw wasn't in there. At least that came out nice and easy. Next up, we gotta take this 12 point nut off. It's a 12.30 millimeter, that wasn't very tight. We also need to take our caliper off. Normally I like to just take the whole caliper and everything off all in one piece. Like many things in this car. It's sad. Okay, you come off of there. You come off of here. Okay, I got our caliper all secured here. In fact, our pads are just gonna fall right out because they weren't installed properly. So we'll put those back in when we're done. That is not what that should sound like. Run this nut out. Now, if this were a, a less bad bearing, we would hook a slide hammer up to it and snatch this hub off. But I was able to just tap the other side off. Inner part of this is actually still on the stub axle, which is this part right here. You also wanna make sure you take a good look at the stub axle, make sure it's not all scored up and damaged and it needs to be replaced. You can see some trailing of where the bearing was worn on this race right here. There's tons of ways to get that inner sleeve off of the stub axle. Today I'm gonna to use a Dremel and just hammer it back off. You could also use a puller to pull that off. I think that's in fact the Volkswagen special tool way, but we're gonna do it this way. Oh my gosh. Ah, oh, why'd you do that? Why did that happen? No, 
Now we can clean up our stub axle here. And just do a quick cleanup of some high grit sandpaper. It's like 2000 grit, I think. Here is our new bearing that we're gonna install. Notice it has the ABS ring on here, which correlates to this sensor right here. If you've been around a while, you know what I'm about to say and that there's a special tool to install this bearing. The special tool is basically a nut like the one that came on it, except it's threaded further in so that it can grab the stub axle while it's in the bearing. But I don't have that. I ordered it, but it didn't come. So we're just gonna go ahead and put this on. If you kind of push it on and get it square, unfortunately, we're not able to thread the nut on. This is not the right way to do it, but this is a 34 millimeter socket. We're just gonna gently tap this on. Make sure it goes on straight too. One tip, if you are going to do this, you need to make sure that the socket goes inside of the bearing. So you'll see this is the inner sleeve of the outer bearing. The socket or whatever you're using has to push on that. If you hammer around here, around the outside, what's gonna happen? You're just gonna puke this out once it goes in. So make sure you don't do that. You wanna press right in there and only go as far as you need to to start the nut and then let the nut do the work. That's probably far enough. Also, if you're doing this on a car that's not, well, this car, it's a good idea to replace the nut and then the dust cap that goes over it. This one's probably gonna need three wheel bearings on that road trip anyway, so I'm not too worried about it. Then once the nut's threaded on, I just ratchet it in. All right, our new bearing is bolted in. Now listen to this. There's drag on the bearing and we don't have that crunchy sound. There's no back and forth wiggle, so that's pretty awesome. Now we just got to put it back to how it was. I'm also going to clean up the rotor. Boy, oh boy, do I wish we were doing an actual brake job on this car while we were in here, but we are not. This... All right, I got the caliper carrier bolted back on. We're going to just go ahead and throw the pads on. And I have to tell you guys, it's breaking my heart to put this back like this. It really is making me sad. I would much rather be putting new parts on it to make sure our old Benji boy is in good shape, but I guess that is a project for another day. The other side caliper, boy, was she, uh, was she sad? That dust boot is all torn up. I guess that's the life of Stance Nation and probably more likely the case, owning a car from Massachusetts or Connecticut or wherever the heck this car came from, the North. It's throwing me off because this rotor is like cocked in at the top. It's like messing me up. I'm feeling like I got it on wrong. Do a better brake job than I just did, kids. Sad Panda. How about that? Well, it's better than it was when it came in the shop. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. If you guys have questions or comments, drop them down below. Good luck to the boys at Gears and Gasoline on this just insanely bonkers road trip. With that, I'm out, have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you again next time.